Morning, friends. It is seed start and Saturday. Thanks for joining me here for dropping in. Excuse me. Um, kind of a different background today, right? I had a last minute major shuffle Rooney when I decided there were certain things I wanted to show you how I do it today. And I didn't get out here until about 15 minutes ago, was busy writing this morning, then Tucker and I had to go for our walk, and here we are, and I think I have all of our pieces, and even more insight, exciting, I have so many seedlings to show you guys this morning and to talk a little bit about that. So if you're new here, welcome. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, and um, I am the founder and owner of the Gardener's Workshop, which started out as a small urban flower farm. I didn't even know that's what it was really when I started um, back in 1998. This is my 25th year anniversary of growing flowers. Um, and it's just really, really exciting. I am literally located in the middle of the city. Um, I'm in southeastern Virginia, zone 7B, 8A. It literally depends on which way the wind is blowing as to which zone we are. And my little farm started out as an acre, less than an acre and a quarter. The first 10 years, that was all the land that we had in my home and buildings were on that. I had about a little bit less than a half an acre commercial garden and we squeaked out, you know, four to 5,000 stems of flowers a week. So anybody that's feeling penalized because you don't have acres, you just don't know what a gift you have been given. I felt penalized for years until I realized I had flower farming friends that had five acre farms that were producing less than I was because they had so much room that they had to take care of. So friends, you're at the right place if you want to be a small scale acreage, but big producer with less maintenance. And that's kind of what my niche is, I guess you would say. So today, um, oh, and also we have a great platform. Sorry, y'all, I got off track there, didn't I? The gardenersworkshop.com is home base for all the things the Gardeners Workshop is doing from, we have online courses, our online garden shop is there. We only sell in our online garden shop the same tools, seeds, and supplies um, that I use here on my farm as well as my books. And y'all do know I have a new book coming out, right? And we just got the cover last week. So it won't be long and y'all will be in the know on how all of that is coming along. Um, but also it's home base to tons of free resources. Both of our podcasts, Field and Garden, which is um, me typically rambling on about how I do what I'm doing. And then we have Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Um, Lane is the seed manager of our business, and she is also an avid gardener, seed starter. She's an engineer by trade, so she is a deep diver on details. And that's what we kind of bring to you on the Seed Talk podcast. So check that out. Subscribe to our newsletter if you want to know what's happening, when, like when the book will be out, when there's other really exciting things. And we did actually put it in the newsletter last week. So I guess I can tell you guys, my flower farm and school course is actually going to be becoming on demand. What that means is you don't have to wait until the fall. We have just recreated it in a way that it has such powerful tools um, that you're going to be able to buy it 24 seven. Um, and that'll be coming soon here later in the spring. And we're so excited about it. We're about to bloom and bust. That's why we're telling you now. So spread the word. Flower Farming School, the basics, annuals, marketing and more with me will be becoming available here before long. So the point of why we're here today, right, is I have been promising all week that I was going to um, be sharing some of my seed starting, soil blocking techniques um, because there's so many more people soul blocking now, right? I mean, it's just growing. I'm so pleased over that. Um, but there are people that are struggling. And so I thought, what better time than for me to kind of like tell you why I do things the way I do them. It's not that I'm saying in my way is the only way or the right way. It's just the way that I have done it for years. Because let me tell you what my bottom line is. Time, when you're in business, time is money. And 
when you are efficient and don't create problems that by doing something a certain way that you then have to fix it in another step. Um, that's perhaps one of the most frustrating things when you're an entrepreneur and you all of a sudden need more than you, right? I mean, to grow a business, you don't own a business. Um, if what your business is can't go on without you, you own a business, but the business stops when you stop, if you're not able to do your job, right? And um, so totally just lost my train of thought. Anyway, I think what I was getting to was that there's been a lot of watered down versions of the way people are soul blocking. And I just thought I would revisit us here um, on how I do it. But before I start into the actual, I'm going to talk about the soil. I'm going to talk about the technique of actually making the blocks and then a little bit about the growing environment. But I thought to kind of like whet your appetite, let's be looking at some seed starting babies, right? So I had these in front of me that have been under lights. Um, let's see, what is today? Today's the 11th. These were started, Bobo, there's no date on here. Oh, on the 6th. So these have been under lights for a few days, um, as well as these Rebecca's. But I literally, four minutes before coming on, opened um, the grow room and found that more seeds had sprouted. So I want to show you what they look like when I take them off of heat, right? So I have several to show you. So this is sylphid, Celosia sylphid. And literally there are many of these that are still cracking that you can't really see yet, but this is kind of how I take them off the heat. When I see 50% or more, I mean, there are so many that are, their little necks are starting to raise. That's all you need to see, y'all. When you see signs of life in the block, that's when I move it off of light because I'll show you what happens. And here's another one. This is um, this is High Z, which, by the way, you can find all these seeds over on our website. High Z is um, a Celosia spagata. It's a plume, but it's not the big plume. It's a narrower one. So people tend to not be drawn to it. I'm here to tell you, it is a killer spike. The stem is maroon, the the leaves are veiny, um, and it's got beautiful foliage. And it's a little bit red, so you can't see it. But you can see that these probably should have been taken out yesterday. See how some of them are bending? That's what you don't want to actually um, have happen. Um, so that's that one. But look at this one. This one's really bending. This is Pampas Plume. And look how crooked they are. That's because they were on the heat and they were leaning towards the light in the room. And you, you want to try to prevent that. That'll quickly correct itself when I put them under grow lights. But you're, but the way you really want to take them off, you'll see when I show you the first tray that's been under lights for several days, that didn't happen. And that's all about timing. I know that y'all have heard me. Sorry, y'all. Um, I know y'all have heard me reply or mention from time to time that I only go in my grow room once a day and that's first thing in the morning. And that is a big benefit because I'm not a helicopter, you know, seed starter as so many people just, I literally, they just make themselves crazy looking at their seedlings. I don't have that problem. However, it might be a good idea if I had time and thought about it to visit my grow room in the evening before I go in because that would have prevented these from actually leaning. So this is what they look like when I take them off the heat where 50% have popped and the rest, I don't even know if you can see right down here in this one, he is just barely popping. So that is what they look like when they're popping. Now, this is the Celosia. So um, we all I hear from so many people like I don't have enough heat mat space. I don't have enough grow light space. Well, nobody does. It doesn't even matter when you get a big 10 by 10 room like I have that is packed. <laughs> you still don't have enough space. So you learn about what we call the seed starting freight train. It's like Bobo can only start so many seeds in a day. And by doing that, it's like those go to heat. And then on the next work day, which is three days later, usually those are ready to come off the heat so she can start another load. So these Celosias have actually been on the heat 
for a week, not a week. They started on the six. So they're actually five days old from the time they were seed started. And you can see that they are not bending. There are still some coming along and being born. This is the um, chief bicolor or Corona. It's often called, that's a Cox comb that's yellow with red slices in it. Um, and so this is what they look like. And this is what you're aiming for, right? But then look at how different seedlings are. So I brought, I haven't water jet this morning, right? Because I didn't get out here until like, you know, 15 minutes to 10 to 11. So these are Rudbeckias that were actually started March 2nd. So that is, these are nine days old. This is the Denver Daisy. And you can see, look how different they are. They grow close to the ground, um, to the soil surface. And just look at what great germination we had. And these have not been water jet. And I brought this one out here because it's so easy to see how dry they are. See how dry these are? This is Sahara. Sahara is a is kind of a mix of different Rudbeckia strands. I mean, obviously you see that because there's different, um, I was going to say makes and models. There's different um, flowers in there and they germinate at a little bit different rate. You can see there's a couple that are tall. Can you, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm having to reach from the edge of this table. Um, you can see that some of them are a little bit taller while other others are still a little shorter and some are still just being born. That's what you have to kind of think about, especially when you're growing a mix, even though Sahara is not called a mix, it is a mix. I mean, that's the nature of what Sahara is. Um, so that's how dry my soil blocks are typically when I come out in the morning. These are a little bit drier than normal because literally I am, normally I'm watering at six or seven o'clock in the morning and it's now 11 o'clock. So they've had, and it's hot and it's sun. It's not hot, but it's very sunny in the room, which makes the room warm. So they are a little bit drier than what um, I want to be. And then I have one last thing I want to show you before I start showing you some techniques. Do you all remember the Lysianthus controversy? So I showed some seedlings on um, Instagram that um, I said that were Lysianthus. Well, I knew when I showed him it was going to cause hoopla because their necks were longer. Lysianthus, like Rudbeckia, typically grows right on the soil surface. Well, I had left these in um, on the heat. Well, actually, these were in a germination chamber on the bottom shelf, and they did not. I didn't see. I just kind of wrote them off that they weren't going to germinate. And so I was going to pick one up and show you guys that they are, in fact, Lysianthus. Um, you can see how tiny they are, but see their necks? They aren't normally like that. They were stretching for light, y'all. Um, and you can see that they are, these are... January 12th, I'll say that again, January 12th. These are like weeks and weeks old, right? And this is Lysianthus. And you can, see, I don't know if y'all can tell, I mean, you can see from the foliage, they are in fact Lysianthus with longer necks, which is not correct. I also wanna say it is not the right time of the year to start Lysianthus. This was a test, y'all. So we have already planted the plugs out in the garden um, just this week that we bought it, brought in. This was just, I'm just testing how to grow them. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that they were in fact Lysianthus, but they did not, however, look like they normally look. So I want to just run through a couple of um, things to share with you before we start our techniques. First off, yes, I'm not doing my sunflowers today because I did them yesterday on our live show that I did inside the Gardener's Workshop live app. So if you need sunflower information, um, if you don't have our app, just go to your phone's app store, search Gardener's Workshop live shop. Um, it's free. Just download it and you can watch the replay. But here's the other thing. We offered a special bundle yesterday that's available until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. You can get five of the 128 plug trays and a collection of those go-to sunflowers that I start every week. 1,200 seeds of six different types. They're individually packaged. So you get 1,200 seeds and the five plug trays. And I think it was $59 
That is $10 off what it normally is as a kit, which is actually $5 off buying everything separately. So it's about a $15 saving. Shipping is $9.95. So you'll find that when you go into the app under the tab for, with yesterday's date on it. Um, but we had some great bundles yesterday that you would want to check out with that. And then also, if you are a flower farmer, this Wednesday, Ellen Frost is doing is taking over what we normally call Ask a Flower Farmer on Wednesdays on Instagram Live at 12.30 Eastern Time. But when Ellen does it, we call it Ask a Florist. And if you are selling flowers or want to sell flowers to a florist, this is your opportunity. So Ellen is a delightful, smart, savvy businesswoman. Um, she is where you want to actually bring your questions on Wednesday, right on the Gardener's Workshop live Instagram. Um, and Ellen does two courses for us, Growing Your Business with Local Flowers. She teaches florists why they should buy your flowers. So you definitely want to be hooking your customers up to Ellen. And then she also has a course called Preparing to Sell to Florist, which is totally awesome. Um, it's an on-demand course. I think it's 50 bucks. You can go in and get it. Um, and it's, I mean, who better to learn from, right? So check those things out. All right, so let's talk about some techniques of seed starting with soil blocking. And some of these techniques are true for any type of seed starting. And I think the one that a lot of people, um, it's just really easy to skip over and think it doesn't really matter. And it doesn't. If there's one thing that I've learned um, as I was a dog enthusiast for 20 years, meaning I was heavily, I worked for a veterinarian, I ran a business I was the business manager for an animal hospital for 18 years um, before I became a flower farmer. And during that time, I was heavy into the sport of golden retrievers. I mean, everything from hunting tests and obedience and participating in confirmation shows and grooming and training and caring and all that stuff. If there is one thing that dogs and people and plants have in common is how important the first weeks of life are. I mean, there's there's bonds and ways of life that are made or broken during that time that, yes, you can definitely overcome them later in life. But if it's done properly at the start, you don't ever have to deal with them. And I feel that way about seedlings. Um, I did a um, podcast with Jenny Love on the no-till flowers just recently where we talked about this. Jenny and I are kindred spirits in this effort that you know, and she pointed out that actually the first few days of a seedling's life when it the embryo is born, um, you know, it affects how that plant performs for the rest of its life. So we really want to do everything we can to kind of usher it in and give it what it needs because friends, it affects its disease and pest resistance, how it grows, how abundant stem length, all that mess, all the troubles we have later in life, oftentimes are related to their beginning of life. And so I feel like um, people have really skipped over a very important part. And of course, you know, it's to each their own. But I never use and never have because I learned from Elliot Coleman, who is the master of, I mean, he's Elliot did, did the deep diving on why we should do the things that I do. I don't feel the need to do, to investigate and know. I know that that is his area of expertise. And when he said we shouldn't use sterile soil to start seeds, because then your seedlings have no natural immunity to anything because it's sterile. So any bad thing that's introduced, which happened naturally, they have no way to fight them. So I've always been a living soil user. And part of that is you have got to sift the soil. And I hear more belly aching about this and I totally get it. And I'm going to tell you all this um, here that um, you want to know one of the reasons that we stopped selling the ready to use blocking mix is because slowly over time, the quality of it being sifted kind of got worse and worse because it's, you know, an added step that has to be done. Um, and if you actually purchase seed starting mix, you will notice, first off, it's very expensive because it has been sifted. And when you get those chunks out, it just makes 
there's no debris to screw up um, making blocks if you're doing soil blocking, but also chunks of wood and chunks of anything in there can really affect the balance of nutrients that are actually in that soil. So I'm going to sift for you guys right here and just show you how simple and easy this is. Now I'm going to So that's the sift. All right, so I'm gonna pour. So I will tell you that even on, you can do this on a very grand scale, um, but for most of us as either home gardeners or small market farmers, literally I find that using a five gallon bucket, and if I was doing this, if this was the time of year for me to do it, I'd have a um, 50, not a 55, I think it's a 40 gallon galvanized with a top bucket that would be sitting here for me to dump this five gallon bucket into. And I usually do this outdoors during the winter and cool season because it's kind of dusty. Um, and it's a really comfortable time to do it, right? So this is our sifter that fits perfectly on top of a five gallon. And I'll show you what it looks like when I show you what's going on here. So I am just sifting some of the mix, which was supposedly supposed to be ready to be used. You're not going to believe what's coming out, what, what's going to be left in here. I'll show you both both sides of what I'm doing. And this is a little higher than what I usually do this. I usually do it down on a lower table. And I will tell you that was not much soil at all. So let me get this so y'all can get the full effect. I, I shouldn't have wore a white shirt today, y'all. Can y'all see? Look at all these chunks. That is all debris and chunks of sticks and all kinds of, you do not want that in your seed starting mix. You want your seed starting mix to look like this. And I understand that it's a pain. It was really, really hard for me when I was first starting out. And I had this homemade um, sifter kind of that, um, let me get rid of this so I can show you all. I guess I'll pour it in there. This is what the sifter looks like. And you'll find this on our website. Um, and I believe that is quarter inch and it does a great job. Back when I was first starting out, um, Steve's grandpa had a sifter, kind of something you could tell he put it across a wheelbarrow. And I used that for a long time, but having to use it on a wheelbarrow made it really low. It was really, really a backbreaker to do. Um, and I struggled for many years until Steve made me a bigger one that went, actually he made me a table that had the wire on the top, which could be used for other things that I could put my 55 or 40 gallon bucket underneath of it to just catch the stuff. I would definitely lose some, but it was quick and easy to do. Sometimes, just like sifting this soil, taking a moment in the beginning to do something right, set you up for success. And y'all, I'm the worst about, oh, just let's just do it. You know, I am, entrepreneurs are kind of that way. They're like, they're seeing dollar signs everywhere, not meaning making money, talking about wasting money, right? And time is money. So I find that a lot of people skip sifting. Sifting is just been essential. And if you put compost into your soil, which I can't imagine starting seeds without having a compost in the mix, um, you've just, it just, it's just so, it can be so very, very much better, right? So sifting. Now I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to bring my tray up here and, um, you have to know that after when I first launched, so I became, I started flower farming in 1998. Sorry, I'm stammering y'all here this morning. Um, I started farming in 1998, went big. I was growing so many flowers on this two quarter acre gardens. Um, my highest dollar per square foot was during that time when I was by myself and only had two quarter acre gardens, but I was on the verge of killing myself. It was such heavy, long, hot work, right? So I crashed and burned and that's what led me to start speaking and teaching which then in turn led me to launch my retail business of selling the stuff that I actually um, use, right? Tools, seeds, and supplies. Y'all may probably have never heard this. 
So when I first launched the Gardener's Workshop in 2005, I launched it in what is called a direct sales company. That's a business model. Think Pampered Chef. Because in my mind, my sister and I dreamed this up. In our mind, people needed to be instructed on how to use stuff, right? So what better way to do it than to have, we called our sales reps garden stewards. I mean, y'all, we went big. I had salespeople in nine states. It was and the Gardener's Workshop was the name of it. And what this meant is that I had to teach people how to seed start. And I was typically doing that in the middle of somebody's gorgeous living room, right? And I soil blocked for years successfully, A, without getting my hands dirty and B, without dropping a crumb outside of the tray. And so I think I was just so well instructed on how to do that. It just led us to be super successful because when you're not getting, I have people that have been here with us that I watch them soil block and think, I just can't even imagine how you do that. I mean, their hands get dirty and muddy. They make a mess. Um, it makes your hands, and when you get grit on your hands, it makes it hurt to do it. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. So I thought I would just give you a little crash course on the way that I do it. So number one is we always start, um, do soil blocking in some kind of tub. Um, this can be a kitty litter box. I've actually, Suzanne and I have seen these trays. We used to sell these trays but literally 50% of them would be broken when we received the shipment because they're kind of rigid. So we stopped selling them, but we've seen them in big box stores online. So you can check it out. You can see the front lip is lower. Um, and literally the price they sell them for today is less than what I used to pay for them. So you can find those here. So you need a tub with sides so you can add the water. And I'm not going through every single step, um, there's plenty of tutorials on our website, as well as I have an online seed starting course that brings all the components that you find scattered everywhere together of me taking you from beginning to end. But what I want to point out is basically a recipe um, to make your own blocking mix, because, um, you know, as I've mentioned, there are a couple of brands that people will use. Um, Fort V and McEnroe, um, those are two soil brand mixes that are known to do well with soil blocking, but you still have to sift them, y'all. They've got chunks in them. So the recipe that we use when you're mixing your own is peat moss or cocoa fiber along with compost and some nutrients. The recipe that comes on the nutrient mix, and it's always on our website as well, um, makes about 20 cups of mix. And actually, when I make it, I use an eight cup measure times three is 24. So I typically do about 24 cups. You don't want to pack this tray full of soil because it makes your blocker a mess and it makes it harder to get it the right consistency and to actually do the job. So I'm trying to make this so y'all can see it and not me. So my method of madness is that the soil is already mixed according to the um, recommended measurements, which is three parts of dry to three to one part of water. I find that a potato masher is the best darn tool. And literally, I think one of the things that most people are resistant to um, is that blocking is a two handed job. So you have to, you hold the stationary bar. Notice that I have a pile of soil, and that was a little too deep actually, to push the blocker down into. And it just makes it simple and easy. And then you strike it off and make your blocks. We use flat bottom trays. You give it a push and a pull, and there you go. There is no real mesh. You don't get anything on your hands. Um, so you don't have to waste time washing your hands. You don't have to have grit on your hands. Um, you know, I see a lot of people, um, including people that have been here with me, that wear gloves because they get their hands dirty, but it's really not necessary if you don't overfill. So a 24 cup mix of this typically does about, let's see, it does about 600 blocks and that's two and a half of my cafeteria trays. Um, and if you have your cans of sifted and prepared products sitting right here, 
it takes you a nanosecond. Three scoops of mix, one scoop of water, mix it, make your blocks and move on. It is a quick and efficient, I gotta look at my note, y'all. Quick and efficient way to do it. Um, so that's the other thing I want to talk about is the measure. The simplest thing is to have, I use an eight cup plastic measuring cup. And I use that and I actually have two. Well, actually I have three. Three of the very same ones. I have one in the dry mix. I have one, um, actually I have more than that. But you need to have one in your dry mix and then one that you can actually use to fill with water um, that you don't have to worry about drying. You're going to use eight cups of water and you're going to use eight cups of dry mix three times to create the mix. And why is it important to measure? Because do you want to know how much time is spent and wasted? I watch it all the time, y'all. You just dump some blocking mix in and then you put a shot of water and you mix it. Oh, it needs a little more water. Mix a little more. You Oh, oh now I've put too much water. I need to put more blocking mix. You eliminate 99% of that by measuring. Yes, sometimes depending on the con moisture content of the dry soil blocking mix, you may need to add a squirt more of water, but most often you do not. And again, I just want to say I am all about time is money. And my time is precious and I don't want to waste time. And I don't want people that are being paid to do it to waste time doing that, right? So sifting, measuring, and not um, putting too much in your tray, which it is really hard to resist to because you think, oh, it'll save time. I'll do a double recipe. How many? Now, I will add, if I'm doing the bigger blocker, the two inch, which takes like a lot more soil, it eats it up much quicker. I might do two recipes for that. But when I'm doing the small blocker, and here's the other tip about that, let's just say you're a home gardener or you're only going to make us one tray of blocks. Um, you know, I still mix up a recipe because it's easier to make the blocks quality wise to have a nice pile of mix to push your blocker into. You just let the mix dry out. You don't, I mean, you're not wasting it or losing it. You would never cover it and trap the moisture. I mean, I just set the tray aside. Literally, this tray with the blockers and the mixer literally just get shoved up under a bench on a shelf, out on the carport under a shelf until we're ready to roll again. Um, and then you just re-wet it. So, I mean, it's really, really so much simpler than we tend to make it. All right, so let me get rid of this. What am I going to talk about now? Oh, I did talk about the technique. Um, you know, and Suzanne and I, I'm so well aware of this, that when Suzanne and I used to do these big shopping shows and in live, you know, big, we would go do big master gardener conferences and we would always have our soil blocking demonstration set up for me to show people and then for people to be able to do it. And I'm telling you, almost Every time somebody picks this up, they pick it up with one hand, just like this, and try to do it. Not only do you then depress the plunger and push the soil out that you're trying to load it, it makes it harder. It makes your hand get dirty. It, you know, it just, I think that so many people have lost the technique. Two-handed, oh, I just threw my notes in the mix. So I'll show you one more time. For anybody that may have just joined us, I tend to have a nice little pile of mix and I push the blocker. I usually push the blocker down twice to make sure that the chambers are nice and full and ooh, kind of reaching across here. Literally, you just give it a push and a pull and there you go. So it's super efficient and super easy to do. And that is the same technique that is used with the two inch blocker. It is a two handed job. It is not a single handed job. And um, I'll tell you that over and over and over again, Suzanne and I, um, that's one of the things that we miss the very much, the very most about going and doing I me. Mean, Suzanne and I talk about it all the time. Y'all, I had an F. 250 extended van. That's the Ford vans that are extra long. We would pack that thing. You could not get a slip of paper in the back. 
from floor to ceiling, front to back. It was packed with all the stuff you see on our website. We would go to these big, comp like master gardener conferences, which are typically only one day. We would unload all that stuff. We had carts, we'd load in, set up, I'd speak. Then we would sell like you wouldn't even believe it. I mean, it was like 10 deep of people mobbing our, our booths and they'd buy everything we brought, but then we'd have to pack up what was left over and leave. I mean, that's how Suzanne killed her shoulders. Um, I killed my elbows. I mean, lifting, we would take, oh my goodness, just crates and crates and crates of blocking mix and blockers. And anyway, we really miss that one-on-one -on -one, um, of doing that. And I will say, you all definitely need to be signing up for our newsletter because there's going to be an opportunity that's not been made public yet. Um, if anybody out there knows what I'm talking about, that you do not want to miss. Um, so we, so you want to get on our farm news so that you get the news um, on everything that is actually going on. So it's a two-handed job. And then what I'll finish up with is that the other part of this equation is taking some time to create your growing environment. Um, we just hear from so many people that are trying to start seeds. First off, when you're soil blocking um, and using the small blocker as we do for the most of what we do, um, it takes up little space. In the space of 12 inches by 24 inches, you can grow and support 240 of those small blocks. That's a lot of plants for a, particularly a home gardener. With, um, me, and because the trays have no drainage holes, you can do it anywhere. You could do it in a spare bedroom. You can do it on top of a clothes dryer. I did it in my pantry before I got a building. I did it in my cellar. But you know what the problem with my cellar was? It was too cold down there. So what I'm saying is it take the time to really carve out a really great growing space. It doesn't have to be very big because where you can germinate stuff, you know, using a seedling heat mat and people are thinking that they can do that out in a cool garage. It, if you're trying to start cool flowers, you might, if it's not too cool out there, you might get away with that, but they're not going to grow in that environment. And warm season tender annuals, like all this celosia that I just showed you, would not sprout in those conditions. I don't care how hot your warm season, your um, heat mat is, because the air temperature plays a big role. So creating a grow space that you can control a little bit, whether that's a closet where you can open and shut the door and concentrate the heat. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I prefer T12 or T8 grow light, fluorescent grow lights over LEDs because they have a low amount of warmth. And if you used grow lights like that and had a space that you can close in like a closet maybe or one of those tents, I've seen all kinds of setups where it warms the air temperature up a little bit. You have to think about all those things. So I hope that sharing my techniques um, of how important it is to sift your soil and again, making it easy to sifter on that five gallon bucket and make it so you can do it at a level that is comfortable for you. It is not a backbreaker. Do it outdoors. Do it when it's cool. Do not do it right now if you live where I am because the wind is so much it would blow it all away. I mean, it's like a gale blowing out there today. Um, so sifting the soil, not overloading your tray, um, and measuring your blocking mix and using the measured water that goes with that. So you save time trying to fit. I mean, how, how many people do you think make bread and don't measure? Nobody ever did, right? So think about that. Then remember, it's a two-handed job. You do not have to make a mess. And it's not that I'm, and I am a bit of a neat freak but it has nothing to do with that. If you make a mess, then that's got to be cleaned up. If your hands get filthy, you have to wash them. You have to stop to do it. Then you have to dry. You know what I mean? It's like, this is a business owner talking to you, um, that all of those added extra steps are just not necessary. And then beef up and give a little bit more thinking time to your growing environment. All right, friends, let's see if I can find a couple questions here to answer. Um, 
So we have folks from all over and I see um, um, Jesse's on here posting a lot of the links that I mentioned. Thank you so much. And I see some of our students are posting their sunflower emoji. And y'all, you did. I don't know if you heard of me earlier or not, but my big flower farming school is going on demand in just a few weeks, um, which means you'll be able to purchase at any time. We've created tools um, with just hundreds of questions answered. And it's just, it's going to be great. Wait till you see it. So here we go. So Amber is asking, I'm planting out my cool flowers this week and wonder at what temperature do I double cover with frost cloth? Looks like we have a low of 19 degrees later next week. So Amber, that's a really great question. One of the things that you need to remember is that plants aren't as winter hardy while they're not yet established or they're in the process of becoming established. So I would definitely double cover. 19 degrees is, you know, kind of cold for a new young plant that may not have her roots sunk in deeply. So I would, I think I would definitely double cover and we use the lightweight row cover so that we can do that. We can double when we need it. And that just brings me to another point. Um, you know, yesterday when we were on, I was on the live show, one of the uses that we talked about for the floating row cover, one of the ways that I use floating row cover um, for windy, windy pre-spring weather, for me, that's March. March has some warm afternoons, sometimes warm days, but the wind is usually like blowing like a gale and it's chilly outside. I mean, I just walk the dog in my winter coat, you know, with the hood up because the wind is, it's not so, so cold, but when the wind blows, it is cold. Well, your plants are experiencing the very same thing. So for a quick use of row covers on whether it's cool flowers or yesterday, I talked about doing this for newly planted sunflowers is to use row cover without hoops. Um, if you're going to use row flower, uh, row flowers, y'all, I'm losing my mind, row covers for a short period of time, like a couple of weeks, and it's not going to be freezing. I mean, you would have never, you have a row cover on when it's freezing rain, right? Um, but you're just using it right on the plants to protect them from wind. You just don't know how useful that is. It's called floating row cover. That's the lightweight part of the row cover that we sell means it can lay right on top of plants. I wouldn't do that for peppers and eggplants. They tend to resent that. But all the other vegetables and flowers that we grow, literally you can just lay the row cover, not tight, but fairly loose on the planting and weight it down with the weight bags um, to protect them from this whipping cold wind that's actually going on out there. Um, and so Amber, I would definitely provide some added protection. Um, and you won't be sorry you did that. So Geneva is asking, good morning from the Pacific Northwest. How many weeks before last frost do you sow marigold? What size soil blocker do you use? Thanks. So great question, Geneva. I use the, th the small three quarter inch block. You know, we just spear the seed right down into it. And we typically start them three to four weeks before our last frost date or before we're going to plant them this year, because, you know, we're always I've got that book project going on and it's like we've already gotten warm season pictures last season. But I'm always thinking, man, we could get a better shot of that, couldn't we? So I'm planting a little bit early. I'm starting a little bit earlier to be able to put out earlier plantings with hoops and row covers, which I don't normally do for just to get them in the ground earlier. So three to four weeks before you plant them and we use the three quarter inch soil block. Um, and I already have some going, so. All right, so let's see what this is. Good morning. Good morning from Southeast Michigan. First time growing cut flowers and first time soil blocker. You have bit off a big old bite. I have a goal and need to meet a goal. Try, going to try to meet it with flowers. Oh, that's awesome. So join us each week. Be sure to check out the Gardener's Workshop Facebook page. 
um, all, we have a private community of my students, um, but once you have to become a student to do that, that is also an amazing community. Um, and remember, we do Instagram Live every Wednesday with, if it's not myself, it's other flower farmers that could really be helpful and supportive. So Janet is coming to us from South Africa. And, you know, I have actually had several students in South Africa. Um, my very first year, it was such a learning curve for us. The very first year we launched Flower Farming School was 2018. And um, she was in our first, year, first class and she had to drive 10 hours to get to a market. Think about that. I mean, so she actually ended up working together with other farmers for all their product to be taken to a market. Um, but anyway, welcome, Janet, from South Africa. All right. Let's see. What is this Patty has? Love the vegetables, love flowers book. She tells all the planting tips for everything she plants. Thank you, Patty. You know, um, Vegetables Love Flowers is not a book about vegetables. It's a book about why vegetables love flowers and then how to grow the flowers. It's really about a three season cutting garden and um, all the benefits from setting up a cutting garden, maintaining it, and then how I care for my garden and farm without using pesticides. And Actually, um, vegetables love flowers. Greatest gift is teaching people how to succession plant. Um, there's diagrams in the back. Um, so thank you, Patty. And there's also a free video book study um, that goes with, but actually with both cool flowers and vegetables love flowers. You can find that and request it. It doesn't matter where you bought the book. You can request that on the product sales page on my website, thegardenersworkshop.com. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'll be doing something like that with my new book. And y'all stay tuned for that. All right, friends. So I am, um, I'm just reading to see if there's a question that I can help somebody. So Beth, funny. So she says she's having trouble germinating Cherokee Sunset. Um, and her prairie sun germinated perfectly. You want to hear something funny? I'm having the complete opposite experience right now. I just, we started all the Rebeccas again. You know, we're trying to see Rebeccas need 12 hours or more of daylight to initiate flowering, which is why you can't just start them in the middle of the summer and hope to have them blooming for the fall because the days start getting shorter, right? So we just started all the Rebeccas, which are slow growers, Again, seeing how late we can push the blooms, right? Um, and so my prairie sun is got iffy germination with old Cherokee sunset right next to it, germinating up a storm. So basically, I sow the seeds on the surface. Be sure you have good soil to um, seed contact. We do not cover the seed. The seed is on the surface. Um, we missed. I do use burlap on top of the soil blocks after we sow them um, to help retain moisture, water them each morning after they dry out. And once about five, we I only started 40. Once about five to 10 have sprouted, I move them over to grow lights um, because I find sometimes with Rebeccas in general, they just need that initial warmth to get them started, to get their juices flowing for the embryo to like break through the outer seed coat. Um, so give that a try. All right, friends. Oh, wait. I saw her help. Couldn't resist it. New flower farmer and soul blocker. And I'm starting snapdragons for the third time. This time they are on a cookie cooling rack and still no germination. I've even tried stratifying the seeds in the freezer. Snapdag dragons do not require stratification, um, although we do store all of our cool flowers in the freezer just because it's A, convenient, and B, there are some that you get stronger germination from when they come out from being in the freezer and it's like, oh, wow, wake up. It's time to grow. It's different temperature now, right? But none of the, none of the um, seeds that we sell typically require stratification just to, just to, to kind of clarify that. 
Um, so we so if for the very best seed snapdragon germination, hands down, is using a germination chamber. Um, that's one of the things we teach you how to build um, in our course. Um, super easy. Me and Suzanne, some foam board, a rolling rack, duct tape, um, and you can actually do it. It's like making a sauna, a steam bath. Um, but we sow snapdragons on the surface of three quarter inch blocks, making sure that there's good seed to soil contact. They do not get covered with soil. They get placed on a cookie cooling rack on top of a seedling heat mat with an air temperature of about 65 to 70 degrees, which triggers the heat of the built-in thermostat on the heat mat. Um, and then we cover it with the wide weave burlap, which helps to retain the moisture each morning pull the burlap back, water the blocks, as well as mist the top. Um, and it's really, it's all comes down to moisture and temperature, not only with soil, but with snapdragons, but they are definitely more demanding in that department. So I hope that helps you. And this is, what is this? Game changer for, got, just got this sifter game changer. I'm telling you all, it's not what you know, it's what the equipment you have. Um, we just, and I'm going to close with this. Um, because I have to go. Um, so I just purchased a big piece of equipment yesterday for our warehouse. It's for one of the products that we actually package, which is very labor intensive. And talking to my husband, Steve, I was baking two pound cakes at six o'clock this morning. He was taking one to somebody for us. Um, and so we were sitting at the breakfast table longer than normal, waiting for cakes to come out of the oven. And the analogy that occurred to me was that all those years ago when I was um, let's see, I had been farming for 12 years before I bought a tractor, my John Deere and a bed maker. Um, I never thought that I could justify the financial investment of getting a tractor until I learned the facts about that. And I bought my John Deere tractor and a bed layer um, together. I think it was thirty three thousand dollars for the both of them. Um, I paid for that John Deere tractor in one year because that tractor made it possible for me to weekly plant sunflowers and extinguish them when they were done to be able to be replanted 1200 sunflowers a week times 26 weeks times back then a dollar and 25 cents wholesale per stem you can do that math that paid for my john deere tractor um, and yesterday, so I was talking this morning that this piece of equipment, which we invested in, it's made in Poland and we won't have it um, for several, many weeks, um, but it will pay for itself in less than two months in the save labor. Not to mention, just like that tractor in the bed layer did, the morale boost to my staff, because it's a labor intensive process to do. Um, we'll be able to offer more. We run out all the time. We'll be able to offer it in different sizes now. Um, so having the proper equipment is perhaps one of the scariest investments you will make. But I am telling you, I have never been sorry. I was never sorry from buying that tractor. When I bought that tractor, I bought it on payments. Um, and I was able, thank goodness, to buy it on interest free, bought a brand new John Deere. So we would not have any, oh, honey, come home. I can't get the tractor started business. Um, and it was the best decision I ever made. Um, and then that decision allowed me to quadruple our business. And so I'm just saying it's only a $20 sifter or a soil blocker or grow lights or a heat mat or whatever. It has such a wave effect of benefiting your business. And nobody knows better than me than emailing the man yesterday and saying, send us the machine. How do I wire the money? Um, it's very, very scary. But that's what you got to do to move forward. And as your business grows, the investments get bigger and bigger. And anyway. So that's what the exciting business is going on around here. So friends, thanks so much for joining me. If you are enjoying my show, please subscribe, share it with a friend, give us a comment. I do try to come back and answer your comments, but time does not always allow it, particularly now while I'm still working on the book. Um, and remember, you can um, drop a review for our podcast. Let me tell you something about reviews that you don't understand this until you're a business owner and particularly an author. Um, every review that you get bumps your platform, whether that's Amazon or the podcast 
platform, that means that they know that people like that product or item and they show it to more people. And reviews are so valuable to me. If you have used any of our products, reviewing them on our website, reviewing them on Google, reviewing them on dropping a like on them helps us so much. And that's what helps me to continue to bring you all so much free content. All the ball makes it go up the hill, y'all. All right, y'all, I got to go. So until we meet again, friends, and Jesse, thank you so much for being back there and helping by sharing all these links. And until we meet again, friends, and remember, those specials are still available inside our app until 8 a.m. on Sunday morning, which is the Succession Planning Sunflower Collection and the Plug Trays um, and other stuff. So check it out. And seed shipping is free over there for seed order only. Seed only orders. All right, friends. And that's only inside the app, not on the website. All right, friends. Ciao.